Good afternoon, everyone. I'm David Talbot, Managing Director and Head of Research here at Red Cloud Securities. Our next presenter is Ross McElroy. He's President and CEO of Fission Uranium. Now, Fission is advancing its large, high-grade, low-cost, triple-R uranium deposit on its Patterson Lake property in the southwest Athabasca Basin. So, Ross, you have 15 minutes, and then we'll have a five-minute Q&A at the end of the session. Uh, everybody put in your questions, and we'll get to as many as we can. So, take it away, Ross. Very good. Thank you, David. Uh, well, it's a pleasure today to be able to discuss Fission Uranium Corp and to update you on its Triple R high grade uranium deposit, uh, which has the potential to be one of the world's lowest cost uranium mines and with the benefit of being located in one of the lowest risk geopolitical areas of the world. And, sorry, just trying to advance here. Um, so with, you know, now more than ever, we believe that PLS is the right project. And now is the right time for development. What I would draw your attention to are some of the key points that, uh, that I think really, uh, really reflect this. First of all, a strengthened uranium sector. Um, I think it's, it's been a little over a year now, almost a year and a half since we've really started to see a, a turnaround in the uranium sector. There's been higher prices. Uh, and I think that it really is focused on a continuing uh, increase in realization that uranium and nuclear fuel is a, a, an important part of the equation for the green energy. And um, so it, I think as everybody wrestles with how do we clean up the environment, deal with uh, climate change, it really puts a spotlight on the tier one uranium projects. The triple R deposit on our PLS uh, project is located in a world-class uranium district. The province of Saskatchewan consistently ranked in the top 10 mining investment jurisdictions in the world. In fact, I believe the Mining Journal um, uh, rated Saskatchewan as the number one uh, jurisdiction for mining investment. Um, the project uh, has excellent access to uh, important parts of infrastructure. There's a highway that does run about uh, a kilometer uh, to the to the west of the deposit itself. Um, Fission's, uh, you know, we've we've been retooling the company, changing, evolving from being a, a very very successful exploration group into, um, uh, you know, now building the team with with expert knowledge of, of uranium project development. So we've filled key important roles in uh, VP project development, basically bringing on engineering uh, horsepower. Um, also uh, beefing up the, the group as well on the uh, environmental uh, and permitting side uh, as well. So I think we've really tooled a team that's able to take this, uh, this advanced project and go further because we see the day that this will become a producing asset. Um, the Triple R itself is one of the world's most significant lowest cost uranium projects. We completed a uh, pre-feasibility study in 2019, which under, outlines an underground mining operation, uh, uh, mining currently at around almost 80 million pounds of U-308, uh, scheduled to produce around 13 uh, million pounds for the first five years of mine life. And I think what really is attractive here is that a very, very low cash operating cost of just over $7 a pound U308, that's US dollars. There is a clear development path uh, with the pre-feasibility study complete. We're now well into the feasibility study. Um, we continue in parallel too to advance our uh, environmental and social responsibilities, uh, which we've continuously met since the uh, beginning of work on the project. We do have industry leading experts on the permitting and environmental process in place. And to me, that's key for being able to uh, move the project forward through its next important stages. Um, we still think there's a, a lot of value yet in the, uh, when we compare fission against the even peers in, in our group, when we look at other advanced projects and what companies are being valued on a per pound basis, there's still a, a significant gap between that which fission is, is realizing by the market and, uh, and what some of the others are. And we think, and we've seen it, that gap continuously close over the last year or so. And I think that that will continue to, to be the case as we advance the project. Um, but it does uh, represent a, a, an investment uh, opportunity for those that are focused on value investing. Looking at the project itself, um, Saskatchewan, as I mentioned, is a, uh, 
a number one premier uh, mining jurisdiction. Uh, it also is blessed with some of the best uh, uranium deposits in the world. The grade of Athabasca deposits tend to be 10 to 20 times uh, that of the global average grade of uranium deposits. So grade is uh, one of the key factors in determining economics. And so if we can have grade that's you know multiple times higher than what you see elsewhere, plus the low operating costs, um, you know, it really does put these projects in, into, a, uh, in, into a, a, the spotlight. Um, as a global supplier, Canada has been an important long-term supplier of, of uh, uranium for the nuclear energy world. Um, currently, we're around 10 to 15% uh, supply of, of, of the uranium. Um, and, and I think it's going to continue to be such an important player, um, you know, as, as we move outward. So there's a lot of deposits and a lot of resources in the Athabasca Basin and, um, and low cost producers, I think, are going to be those that can really take advantage of the, uh, of the environment that we're in. This is a map showing the Athabasca Basin. So we're looking in northern uh, Saskatchewan, right in the middle of Canada, essentially. The last 50 or 60 years of, of production has really been focused on the eastern side of the basin. We made our discovery a decade ago, 2012, with the Triple R deposit, um, followed pretty closely by NextGen's discovery of the Aero deposit. And I think what is pretty clear is that the southwest side of the basin is really uh, where the next, uh, I'd say in the next decade, that will be a shift from a lot of mining activity you'll start to see development over in the southwest side of the basin. So truly a, a very, very important upcoming um, area for mine development in the um, Athabasca Basin. This is a, an image showing what a number of the deposits in the Athabasca Basin is. Our triple R deposits, the, the one on the left side of the, the, uh, the graph here, what it is, is the basement hosted deposit, and it's just outside of the periphery of the Athabasca Basin itself. So being basement hosted has a number of advantages and probably the greatest of that being much more competent rock than you would see within the Athabasca Basin or right at the end conformity. So easier to mine, less technically challenging. Um, and being outside of the basin margin, uh, that puts the basement up near surface. So our deposit actually is very shallow. It starts at 50 meters below the surface and essentially between 50 meters and 300 to 325 meters below the surface. That's the bulk of the triple R ore body. This is a cross-sectional view of the triple R deposit. It's comprised of five zones that we've outlined by drilling. Two of those zones were, were part of the pre-feasibility study. So the main uh, zone on the deposit is the R780 East Zone, which on its own uh, hosts around 100 million pounds of uranium at uh, around 2%. Um, but I think significantly, we know that there's growth potential in the resource. Uh, our second largest zone by size is the R840 West Zone. It was not part of the pre-feasibility study because the drilling at the time wasn't, uh, didn't have the density that we would be able to classify as indicated resources and so it was not able to be brought into the pre-feasibility. But we've changed that with our drilling last summer. We put 25 holes into the R840 West Zone and there's still some modeling work to be done but you would have seen probably about a month ago we put out assay results, spectacular assay results on the R840 West Zone. We're confident that we have been able to convert the, uh, the 840 into indicated and it will be part of the um, part of the resource that's being used in the feasibility study of which we're ongoing right now. So there is good growth potential from that, which we've outlined already in the economic studies. And I think the inclusion of the 840 West Zone uh, should have a, a fairly material impact. What we saw in the pre-feasibility study, so just some of the, the highlights there, as I mentioned at the beginning, very low operating costs, just over $7 US a pound, a short construction time, uh, looking at around three years uh, once we get started before there's ore coming up on the ground. Strictly underground uh, mining scenario using long hole stoping. Um, that has great support by the local rights holders and stakeholders in the area. 
uh, as well as it's also supported by the economics. The economics are superior with a, a fully underground mining scenario as well. So looking at a high IRR, 25% after tax, and an, uh, an NPV of around 700 million uh, Canadian. With uh, being underground, also has a very small environmental footprint. So these are the factors that uh, I think are, are real game changers in, in being able to not only uh, you know show that the, the project is economically robust, but also will be accepted by the um, you know the local rights holders and stakeholders and, and government authorities in the area. Just quickly on the the timelines where we're at, um, we are. Uh, we started our feasibility study back in the summer of 2021, so we're about you know, seven or eight months into it right now. We expect to be completed feasibility by the end of this calendar year. Um, uh, we're currently in the uh, in the on the regulatory front uh, permitting. We're in the um, environmental assessment phase, so that will include the feasibility, completion of the baseline environmental work certain agreements that we would have with uh, with impacted uh, Indigenous First Nations and Métis groups in the area, followed later by sometime around mid-2023, we expect to be entering into the environmental impact assessment phase. Um, after two to three years in that, uh, we would expect to receive licenses to, to build and operate. So construction beginning around 2026, three years later, Towards the end of the decade, we're looking at Triple R being a producing asset. Some of the work that's ongoing at the moment um, right now, we're really focused on geotechnical work right now in, in the field. So there's uh, some large diameter uh, geotechnical holes on the 780 zone. Also, um, we're also doing some work in anticipation that the 840 zone will be part of the mine plan as well. So there's also some geotechnical work to be done there. And even looking out a little further, expecting that the 1515 West will eventually be part of the mine plan as well. We're taking the opportunity to do some early stage geotechnical work on the, um, on the 1515 West zone as well. Plus there's the ongoing permitting uh, work uh, and also work with, uh, with the local groups, um, building relationships with our uh, rights holders and stakeholders. Just quickly, while we still got a few minutes, I, I did want to touch on some of the assay results that we saw out of the 840 drilling last summer. Spectacular numbers. We had spent about three years since we were last drilling on the 840 zone, and you know, I just kind of forgot just how wonderful that the, you know the intersection can be there. We hit one hole with 46 meters at 8% U308, including a very high grade section, 19 meters at 18. I mean, these are spectacular numbers, some of the best you'll see in the Athabasca Basin. We think the 840 um, should have a, a fairly significant impact on the overall um, mine plan going forward. But uh, that's how that looked. If you look comparison wise, this is just a, a chart to, to show that, it, that we are a low, you know, projected to be a very low cost operator on par with the best projects in the world, uh, which are situated in the Athabasca Basin. And when I mentioned a value gap, if you're looking on a per pound basis, compare us against Denison Next Gen, which we you know are our peers in the sector, you can see that we have been closing that gap. There was about a three to one ratio before, it's now two to one. And I think that that ratio, that gap will just continue to close as we continue to move and, and advance the project forward. Um, corporately, we're looking at uh, you know uh, around fit, over $50 million in the treasury right now. So very healthy treasury uh, that will certainly see us through the feasibility work. Uh, and um, corporately we're held around 25% institutional ownership. Uh, the Chinese General Nuclear Power has, is a strategic partner of ours with around 14%. So this is a Chinese utility, one of the state owned utilities and uh, around 60% of the shares are, are held um, by retail. So I think, uh, I think I'm think i coming pretty close to the end of the talk here. This is just a list of the, the, the names of the you know, senior management and board within the company, but you know, really, really strong group, uh, great board, great uh, management group and uh, highly successful company. And so uh, with that, I think I'll, I'll end and um, leave it to you, David, if you've got any questions. 
Okay, great. Thank you very much for the presentation, Ross. So, so we do have some questions lined up here. Um, I, I guess, you know, should we expect another resource estimate out prior to the feasibility study? I know you've had some success with a couple of those Western zones. I believe the 840 you, you were talking about as well. I think the short answer to that is, uh, is yes. You know, we did a little bit of work last year almost a year ago now in the winter on the 780 zone as well. We did some drilling in the, in the area that was primarily still an inferred category. So we put some more drill holes in there to convert the key parts of the 780 that were still inferred to indicated. So you would see some changes in that. And then also I think um, even more material would be the, you know, bringing the 840 from inferred to indicated. So yeah, I think once we go through the process of remodeling and um, seeing what resource is, I'm uh, comfortable to be able to, to provide a resource estimate, which will be um, prior to the feasibility study coming out. So um, feasibility will be the end of calendar year. I would look towards a, a resource estimate uh, change somewhere around middle of the year. Okay. Okay. No, sounds good. Your, your pre-feasibility study was 2019. Right. Now, should we expect many differences between that and the upcoming feasibility study? You know, I, I, I'd assume cost creep, uh, you know, but I also think you're going to remain focused on underground mining, but anything else in store, maybe adding the 840 West, for example, to the mine plan? I think that'll be the, the, the single largest, um, change to between the pre-feasibility and the feasibility will be the inclusion. And, and I'm speculating that the 840, because we haven't done that modeling yet, but you know, let's just say from all, all appearances, it looks like it will be part of the mine plan. Um, I think that will be the, the, the single biggest thing. What that would likely do, David, is uh, should be able to provide longer mine life. Um, you know, where we, you're looking at the 840 probably overall has the same grade as the 780. Um, so bringing in another, it's right now the resource on it is 15 million pounds of inferred. Um, if we were able to convert all that and maybe even gain, you know, that could be the, uh, that, that to me would certainly add mine life onto um, the schedule that we're doing. There's been a little bit of rejigging of the decline, where it's located, how it's going in. So, and, um, you know, I think by the, you know, bringing Gary Haywood in as our VP project development, he's been able, you know, an internal basis been able to have a harder look at some of the, the factors that were in the pre-feasibility and you know I think Gary's able to, to recognize a number of areas that so I think that there's actually some cost savings and, and improvements between the pre-fees to fees but you're right cost creep is going to be in there inflation is is certainly a factor to be uh, considered but the price of uranium is also going up too so Okay, and now that 840 zone is probably a kilometer plus from the from the lake. Uh, is that still going to be underground, or you you don't plan to open pit anything? It, it, it's about eight. Uh, it's about well, the closest part's about 600 meters from the shore of the lake, and it, and it's about 300 meters in strike length. All um all underground. In fact, what would happen? We would use the same decline and the same underground workings, just be able to veer off and you know along towards the 840. So. Yeah, it's all being considered, 100% of the deposits being considered as development in an underground scenario. Okay, great. Um, and now just to wrap things up, you know, there were some road closures in northern Saskatchewan by First Nations communities last year. What can you tell us about uh, Fission's social license and relationships with local Aboriginal groups? Well, I think they're very good. You know, um, uh, you have to be always considerate and mindful of, uh, you know, relationships with the North. You can't take anything for granted, but, you know, we've built a, um, a very strong relationship with a number of the, um, the, you know, the immediate area uh, Indigenous groups. There's four First Nations and one Métis uh, group in particular, um, but we, we've already have a capacity funding agreement with the uh, CRDN, the Clearwater River Dene Nation. We're working to have similar agreements with other First Nations there. The state, what I would uh, want people to go away with is to know that I believe most people want to see development in Saskatchewan. Most of the First Nation and uh, Métis groups want to see development. They just don't want to be forgotten about. And I think that that was really uh, what you saw last fall was really, uh, uh, I think it, to me, it was more of a signal to the government than the industry itself. Um, and, uh, 
you know, I think if we continue to, to build and, and not take our relationships for granted, but continue to build on them, I think we're going to get great support for this project. And that'll go a long way towards um, seeing this as an eventual producing asset. Perfect. Okay. Thank you very much, Ross. We'll wrap it up there. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Up next, we have Azincourt Energy on Stream 1, and we have Flying Nickel on Stream 2. Thank you, Ross.